Hello, and welcome to Shark Science Week with Charleston Fossil Adventures. I'm Ash Begale, owner of Charleston Fossil Adventures, and the photographer and co-author of A Beachcomber's Guide to Fossils, published by the University of Georgia and on shelves November 1st. In celebration of all things Sharky, go ahead and pre-order your advanced copy on our website or Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, Walmart, and other online retailers. Links to our website and social media pages in the description. With the increasing popularity of shark content online, we decided to create our first Shark Science Week video for 2020. It seems with each passing year, shows about sharks on television are becoming increasingly ridiculous and further from the science. That's why we're going to shed a light on some interesting facts about sharks in an engaging scientific manner. We'll be joined by some familiar faces in the field, as well as some experts in the paleontological community. So go ahead and grab a drink, serve up some popcorn, and get ready for Shark Science Week 2020. Shark Science Week 2020 is brought to you by the Otades Seed Company, proud purveyors of the finest megalodon seeds in the world. You too can grow your very own megalodon teeth. Each packet comes with 10 seeds of varying sizes and colors. These seeds are real fossilized shark teeth, dating as old as 30 million years. Available for a limited time on the Charleston Fossil Adventures website. Link in the description below. Results may vary. Teeth shown here not typical. Megalodon seeds are actually small shark teeth. Planting and watering teeth will result in wet dirty teeth and not an actual megalodon tooth. Megalodon seed packets are a joke gift for friends and relatives. CFA not liable for lack of transformation. Welcome back. While the popular media tends to focus on the dangerous aspects of sharks, there are so many more incredible facts about these creatures that deserve more of the limelight. Here's our first segment called... Did you know that? Sharks are among some of the most fascinating creatures, as well as some of the oldest on our planet. Paleontologists studying marine deposits over 450 million years old have found fossilized dermal denticles, a type of scale belonging to early ancestors of today's sharks. These scales give shark skin a sandpaper-like feel if rubbed the wrong way. But more importantly, they help streamline a shark's body by reducing friction from the water. Did you know that? Sharks are equipped with built-in metal detectors. No, not like that. Look closely on a shark's body and you'll see teeny black dots around their eyes, nose, and mouth. These are electroreceptor organs part of a shark's sixth sense, the ampullae of Lorenzini. With these, sharks can detect the Earth's electromagnetic field, electromagnetic pulses from potential prey, and even water temperature changes. The hammerhead shark is specially built to use its head like a metal detector to find stingrays hiding in the sand. Did you know that? Not all baby sharks. Wait, no! <laughs> Not all embryonic sharks are born the same. Some sharks give birth to eggs, oviparous, while other sharks give birth to live offspring, viviparous. But wait! Call in the next three minutes, and we'll give you a real treat. Ovoviviparity. This is where embryonic sharks develop inside eggs inside their mother. Then the embryos hatch out of the eggs while still inside the mother. 
But what's really incredible is the fact that in some species, the first embryo to hatch may actually eat the unhatched eggs of his brothers and sisters. This is called intrauterine cannibalism. Did you know that? If you've been on a tour with us, you know that not all shark teeth are alike. The shape of a shark's tooth is driven by its diet. The classic triangular shark tooth of great whites and the extinct megalodon shark indicate a diet of large marine mammals and reptiles. Basically, these sharks need to slice through large prey items. A combination of triangular upper teeth and conical lower teeth indicate that a shark is holding and slicing, even shaking, grabbed prey items. We see this dentition in many extinct and modern reef sharks. Sand tiger sharks possess a mouth full of conical teeth. These long pointy teeth form a cage and are perfect to prevent any small fish from escaping the shark's mouth. One of the last major tooth types found in sharks may have you turning your head. That's right, these teeth are angled sideways and are found in modern tiger sharks as well as many extinct tiger and tiger-like sharks. Such angled teeth are efficient at chomping through a wide variety of prey items, especially the hard shells of sea turtles. Yummy. Did you know that? Lastly, did you know that those scientific names have meaning and proper or more accepted pronunciation? The mighty megalodon means giant tooth, for obvious reasons. The genus name of the snaggletooth sharks, Hemipristus, means half saw, for those coarse serrations along the distal side. It's helpful to know the origin of a specific word to determine its proper pronunciation. Did you know that mako is a Maori word for the actual shark or specifically shark teeth? What's more, though used worldwide as the common name for sharks belonging to the genus Isurus, the Maori pronunciation of the word has become lost. The proper pronunciation is markor instead of mako. In scientific nomenclature, we see the CH pairing quite frequently. The easiest way to remember its pronunciation is to think of a hard K, cut sound, like the word chiropractor. For example, carcharodon, carcarius, pachydiscus, carcaricles, which is a lovely segue to the species name angustidens. Many individuals are fascinated with scientific names, but often don't know where to start when it comes to pronunciation. Luckily, things are quite simple if you know the rival periods of history that defined Latin pronunciation. The four main methods are Reconstructed Ancient Roman Northern Continental Europe Italian Church Latin and the English method which is what we most commonly use today in historical names and mythology. So, back to Angustidens. In the U.S. South, many people have defaulted to a pronunciation where the second to last syllable is stressed. For example, Carcaricles Angustidens. But, thanks to linguistics, we know that all four systems of Latin agree. The accented syllable is always the second or the third from last. And would you look at that? In angustidens, the gus is both the second and the third from last syllable. So, our Latin counterparts would pronounce this extinct shark as Carcaricles angustidens. But this epithet isn't just limited to sharks. Angustidens appears as an epithet to other fossil animals. Arctotherium angustidens and Gomphotherium angustidens, and even plants such as Nidoscolus angustidens and Caliandra angustidens. Did you know that? For an excellent guide on how to pronounce Latin words, I highly recommend a short PDF by Michael Covington on the linguistics of Latin linked in the description below. Oh, what's that? 
This just in, folks. I've just gotten word that our reporter from the field is live with recently discovered shark fossils. Let's go ahead and transfer this broadcast out of the studio and see what amazing shark fossils he's discovered. Take it away, Ashby. Thank you, Ashby. I'm out here live on the edge of Charleston Harbor, and today I've been collecting a lot of fossils that we can find here in Charleston, such as whalebone fragments, chunks of ribs from extinct manatees and other sea cows, and even bits of shell from the carapaces of extinct sea turtles. But, of course, as you know, Charleston is a hotspot for sharks as well, and isn't that what we're talking about? So I've also been collecting some of those really nice teeth of sharks. So we know that sharks have teeth that are made out of a bone type of material covered in a harder enamel. But did you know that shark skeletons are made entirely of cartilage? That's right. Sharks, in fact, have many different types of cartilage inside their body. Their vertebrae, like these, are made of calcified cartilage. It's a little bit harder than the regular cartilage, like the tips of our noses and our ears. These vertebrae can be identified down to the shark groups. Usually, it's safe to take it down to the order level whether a shark is in Carcharhiniformes or Lamniformes. Now, if you find a vertebra within the Carcharhiniformes order, it's going to look a lot like this. There are going to be large holes on the top and bottom of that vertebra. These are the neural and hemal foramina, respectively. This is an area where softer cartilage was projecting up off the top and bottom of that shark vertebra very much like a process projecting off of our vertebrae. Members of the Carcharhiniformes order include the type genus Carcharhinus, which is the broader grouping of bull sharks, duskies, black tips, and others. Tiger sharks, snaggletooth sharks like the extinct Hemipristocera, hammerhead sharks, and other types of ground and cat sharks. Vertebrae from sharks in the Lamniformes order are going to look like this. You see that the large open voids of the Carcharhiniformes order are present, but they're a little more obscured by radiating lamellae. And those are all those little lines that you're seeing across the surface of the vertebra. These are providing structure in between the two articulating plates of that centrum, but it's a little more weakly connected with these than the vertebrae of the Carcharhiniformes order. Members of the Lamniformes order include, of course, our big great whites, the extinct lineage of Megalodon and the megatoothed sharks, thresher sharks, basking sharks, goblin sharks, sand tigers, and mako sharks, to name a few. The second type of cartilage found in sharks is called prismatic cartilage. These are compacted down into little elements called tesserae that are like these little tiny hexagons that provide structure to surrounding areas of the shark's spine as well as elements up inside their head. The last form of cartilage they have is a much softer kind that doesn't really get preserved. And that's what we really think of when we think of the main body of a shark. Now that prismatic cartilage can often be found in fossils here in the Low Country and in other marine deposits across the world. And we can see this in the mandibular and the branchial cartilage. So areas around the gills and areas up around the jaw. There are these really tiny cylinders of cartilage. You can see those little hexagons dotting the surface, and they're often filled with phosphate. And as a result, that's often why we find them pretty frequently. Now, this prismatic cartilage can also be found up closer to the ear area of the shark. We get these as otic capsules. There have been a couple that have been found here, 
uh, including this wonderful one. It's 24 to 26 million years old, collected out of the Chandler Bridge Formation by paleontologists at the College of Charleston. Wow. Thank you, Ashby. That truly is a remarkable fossil. I never knew that sharks had ears. And now, a word from our sponsor. Are you tired of sitting around at home with nothing to do? Do you miss walking the beach and searching for fossils? Don't fret. Charleston Fossil Adventures presents Shark Tooth Sand. Boxes with three, six, and ten pounds of gravel are shipped straight to your door. Each bag has literally hundreds of fossils and shark teeth ranging in size from one millimeter and up. Get yours today over on the Charleston Fossil Adventures website, chsfossiladventures.com slash shop. These kits even come with a private web page to help you identify your fossils. Don't let the Shark Week fun stop. Order your box today. Okay, well, that just about does it for our... Wait, what now? You're saying we're forgetting someone. We already covered fossil and modern sharks. What more do we need to share with our viewers? Oh, you're right. That's no small matter. My apologies, folks. It seems that we have one more shark to discuss here. Without further ado... I present to you our final topic. Okay guys, no Shark Science Week would be complete without talking about the biggest, baddest shark that used to swim around in our oceans. That of course is the mighty Megalodon shark. So uh, joining me this week is actually someone who appeared on Shark Week last year talking about a recent publication about the extinction of Megalodon because we know that he is no longer swimming around in our seas. Joining us is Dr. Bosnecker from the College of Charleston, uh, here to tell us a little bit more about that really cool paper. So uh, we've been working on this, a team of myself and uh, several of my colleagues from the West and East Coast. Uh, we've been interested in figuring out exactly when Carcharicles or Otodus megalodon went extinct. And there was a prior study that had statistically determined that it was in fact extinct, but the error bars on when that happened were quite broad, about a four million year long time span. We reported a bunch of new fossils from the West Coast, from a bunch of different rock units that dated between about two million and six million years in age. And when we incorporated those into a well-constrained data set of fossil occurrences of Carcharicles megalodon worldwide, we concluded that Megalodon was 100% extinct by 3.2 million years ago during the Pliocene Epoch, with a most likely extinction date of about 3.6 million years. So probably extinct by 3.6, possibly as early as 4 million, and certainly extinct by 3.2 million. So the 4 million year long window of extinction was contracted to about 800,000 years. So we had some uh, different ages previously reported. Some people saying as young as 1.8 or as young as 2.6. Um, how do we know that those data are no longer correct? So there's, there's really two or three answers there. And the first answer is that the dates used by the prior analysis were not great in terms of quality. So we actually had to get rid of about 10 of those records because when we looked at the stratigraphy, uh, i.e. the age of the rock layers, the fossils ended up being far older, so maybe middle or late Miocene, and therefore nowhere near the age we're interested in, which is roughly two to five million years. Um, or in some cases, they were actually fossils of great white sharks that had been uh, amateurishly misidentified as Carcharicles megalodon. 
there were some sites where we actually didn't know where the fossils were from. So one site in New Zealand, the megalodon tooth there was from a 200 kilometer long section of coastline. And that's very poor in terms of locality uh, constraints. Uh, the second part is that a lot of the teeth we found to be reworked. So you can have teeth that are superficially appearing much younger than they are in reality. And we're out here on the Carolina coast today finding fossil teeth on a beach. However, this started off somewhere on the bottom of Charleston Harbor and they were dredged and dumped out here and then have been washed out by waves. Uh, so those are teeth that are actually undergoing two rounds of what we call reworking. One round is anthropogenic, so human activity has moved those teeth, redeposited them somewhere, and now the ocean is washing away uh, those reworked teeth in a second round. So they are appearing in modern beach sand, but they are fossils that are at least five million years old or so. That can happen naturally, just like on this beach here, the waves are eroding into the middle of the island uh, that has all sorts of 20th century dredged sediments that were dumped here. But you can also have waves and uh, water activity eroding into per, uh, earlier deposit layers, reworking those teeth with younger fossils. So you can find elsewhere in the Charleston area, Ice Age bison teeth and mammoth teeth that are less than a million years old, fossilized in the same layer as megalodon teeth because the megalodon teeth were reworked from older rock units. So we tried to exclude all cases where fossils clearly had some evidence of reworking. They were rounded, they were fragmented, they had clam borings in them, so on and so forth. We got rid of all those dates that had uh, human error associated with them. Uh, and when we got dates that were associated with fossils where we knew exactly where it was from, who collected it, where it was collected from, uh, and it wasn't reworked, that's when our window of extinction shrunk from a 4 million year period to an 800,000 year period. All right, and so then how do we know that Megalodon is no longer swimming out there in the ocean today? You ever seen one? <laughs> That'd make the cover of Nature, the most prestigious scientific journal, in a heartbeat. Every ichthyologist out there alive would be looking for one. Uh, and they haven't found one. We've had a few hundred years now, uh, or more, rather, of uh, marine science and ocean exploration. And we're no longer in the uh, age of exploration or age of discovery where there be sea monsters here on the edge of the map. That's not the case. Megalodon cannot be alive at the bottom of the ocean because nothing that survives on that much meat lives that deep. Even the Greenland shark still lives comparably in shallow water. We would also find carcasses. And on top of that, the best part about our new study is that we found positive evidence that the megalodon fossil record ends at about three and a half million years. After three and a half million years, there are rocks in California, uh, Japan, uh, and a few other Pacific locations where you find megalodon teeth, and then you find a layer on top of that with great white shark teeth and marine mammals, but no megalodon teeth. So we know that the absence of megalodon it's not because there are no more rocks for Megalodon to be preserved in, but because the fossil record of their teeth actually ends and where other marine animals continue dying and being fossilized, but Megalodon is no longer present. On the East Coast here, most of the fossil bearing units where shark teeth are preserved end at about three and a half to four million years ago. In the fossil record, we can actually call that a pseudo extinction where uh, a gap in the rock record makes it look like something has gone extinct, but it's actually because we don't have any rocks left.
Thank you very much for your expertise and sharing all of that information with us. Absolutely, my pleasure. All right, well, I just want to extend a very heartwarming uh, thank you to Dr. Bosnacker for taking time out of his day to help us understand a little bit more why Megalodon isn't out there in that ocean swimming around. Um, if you are in the South Carolina Low Country and you would like to learn more, you can head on over to the College of Charleston's Mace Brown Museum of Natural History. It is free, open every day of the week, 11 to 4, except Wednesday. Of course, not right now with COVID, but uh, just follow their social media accounts and they'll let you know as soon as it reopens. Thank you, Ashby. Yes, we're very grateful that Dr. Bosnecker took some time out of his busy schedule to help us understand just why the Megalodon shark is no longer swimming in our oceans today. Well, that does it for our first ever Shark Science Week video. We hope you enjoyed this look at some of the more intriguing facts about the sharks that swim and once swam in our oceans. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like, subscribe to the channel, and click that bell below to enable notifications about new videos we post. Stay tuned next for the season premiere of Skydiving with Sharks because 2020 hasn't thrown enough at us already. Looking sharp, fellas!